Hey, I'm grateful that you're tuned in. I'm grateful that you're a part of this broadcast. I want to talk to you about something that is quite dear to me. Uh, sad news, sad news as well. We had a prominent pastor, a uh, bishop there, Carlton, Carlton, I know his name, Carlton Demetrius Pearson, Bishop Pearson, also known as Bishop Carlton Pearson, passed away on November the 19th, uh, 2023. And I believe the church owes him an apology. I believe that they owe him an apology. I know y'all gonna get upset about this, but I just believe <clears throat> that he, they owe him an apology. Uh, one of the most prominent pastors uh, in the 20th century, I mean, prominent uh, with everything that he was doing, he's also prominent because of his different belief there. And I, I don't like it. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I don't like what I'm seeing a lot of times on social media now that he's passed away. You've got these chump pastors, these pitiful pastor, pastors, rather, uh, pitiful pastors who are, you know, making statements and, you know, saying thing that he now that he's dead, he's proven wrong. He knows the truth. Foolishness. Absolute foolishness. You know, absolute foolishness. And, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is that we just went from a practical standpoint. This man's net worth was 16 million. What you doing? Nobody even know you. Nobody knows you or what you're doing. You're a pastor with a small little Facebook following. And you did. You said that ignorance just for your little 17 likes. And nobody likes you. Nobody knows you. And you're still broke. Uh, and that's the truth of the reality. You know, even though he believed differently and did things his way, he still taught the, the church. He taught the church how to do a conference. You know, we will never forget the Azusa conference. We'll never forget the Azusa conference and what that did for the body. You know, uh, we know several people who are prominent now. They're prominent now who came to, you know, level of influence, but they had to come through that conference that gave them a, a greater level. You know, one of my very favorite who's passed away, gone on to be with God now, one of the people who I really admired and uh, was inspired by was Bishop Varon Ash. Uh, to this day, I haven't saw a white gentleman, a white preacher preach like he preached. But then not only that, with so much insight, so much revelation. Uh, and let's be real about it. Carlton Pearson, Bishop Pearson was not just a preacher, not just a pastor, not just a bishop. But he was a scholar. He was a scholar. He was educated. Uh, you would hear it when he would speak, articulates very well. And I think that's what most people, I think it just kind of added to that mindset at the time of people feel like, well, you shouldn't do too much reading, too much learning. You just, you just, you know, and you have a lot of pastors right now, black pastors especially, who fear education, who fear education. I don't have any problem with education. I myself uh, have been uh, have, have went to school for theology. Uh, I believe in a grand shout out to Grand Canyon University. Uh, but uh, I, I just think that it's a problem when we fear that. Now, he believed differently. I'm going to tell you this. I don't believe that you are really in God if God doesn't speak to you and challenge you with something that everybody don't may not agree with. You know, I just believe that being effective means that you're going to be not liked in some regards. And I just believe that in this regard, uh, Bishop Pearson was one of the first pastors to really jump out there and get, and say something that got the church to think, think. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about just talking about it. I'm talking about think. You don't agree. Now, here's the here's the separation right here. When he said what he said about there's no hell or different things like that, uh, then I think a lot of times then I went back and looked at it with my understanding of it, because it was uh, you're talking about a generation of people then a time, a place and a time where people believe and were speaking very strongly on holiness or hell. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I don't agree with that fully because it can say so many things. It makes Christianity more about rules than it is about relationship. Jesus came about the relationship. Now, there are rules, but we can't make the rules everything. And I just believe that it, what he was saying really came against that hyper Pentecostal aspect of uh, that we were in at that time, which is everything will send you to hell. If you don't do this, 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 you're not going to heaven. If you do one thing wrong, you're going to hell. And uh, I don't I, 
I don't agree with that. I also don't agree with the opposite uh, side of that, which is uh, once save, always save. I, I do believe that it is. Uh, I do believe in it to this degree here. I just don't believe in it without. I believe that if you if you go against what originally got you saved, you go you go against that, then you're you're no longer saved. If you stop believing, uh, so I do believe in once save, always save to the believer as long as you believe. Uh, but this was speaking in a time where that holiness of hell thing, and you still get, you still get. You still get old preachers that will focus on that and uh, say that, and, you, and it gets a response. Holiness is holiness of hell. It is holiness of hell, and 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 that's fine. That's fine. I, I do agree that there, you know, there are things that separate us. There's going to be the holiness, but I believe it's the relationship itself that separates us, and not something uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, different. Uh, such as all the rules. Now, I'm saying that to say I do believe, and y'all are not going to like me for this, but I believe black church owe him an apology. I believe a lot of these people with influence. I'm looking at what you're saying. I believe the whole world. I've been looking at what he's doing because if we look at what happened with Bishop Carlton Pearson, if we look at him, um, you know, which, what happened with his church, Higher Dimensions Family Church, uh, went from 6,000, they had an average attendance of over 6,000, and then they went down after he spoke like he spoke. But let's be real. This is the first ever that I remember uh, episode of someone being canceled in, in the church. I'm going to say in the world. I hadn't saw it before then, uh, but I'll say in the church, he was canceled because of what he said. And then some people piled on, people who knew they owed their whole ministry to this man and what he had done for them by giving them the platform. He didn't have to give that to them. Some of them didn't even come to talk to him or have a conversation with him. Many of them just piled on without asking why, without asking why. And they jumped into the media and just started drinking the Kool-Aid of the media without ever asking the man or having a conversation with the man. Now, let's be honest. I'm, I'm grateful to see that there was a level of love given to him in the world, in, you know, in the latter years of his life. I'm very grateful. But I was inspired. He was an artist as well. We have several of those Azusa uh, Street I'm sorry, not Azusa Street, but the Azusa Conference, rather, uh, that he was a part of where he would sing those traditional songs. And we all know those traditional songs, you know. i never forget when he's telling the story about the uh, keep keeping on in. Uh, I believe that's what, what he was saying then, uh, keep keeping on. He's talking to the uh, the, the mother there. Uh, you know, he would change his voice. I, those are all heartwarming stories uh, that Bishop... Pearson exposed us to, wonderful thing, exposed us to great people, great artists. There are artists who came through there. But I just want to say, I just want to say, uh, yeah, just stuff knocking around here. I just want to say that I believe that the church owes him an apology. I believe that they owe him an apology. And uh, I believe, you know, the significance of what he did taught us how to have those large conferences. There were no woman that will lose conferences before Azusa. There were no manpower conferences. And I know those are two TDJX conferences. Uh, there were you, you name all these other conferences and how to do them and how to put psalmist on program and how to have things that keep people engaged and getting speakers to be uh, at a certain place uh, all at the same time and bringing the whole world together. You know, all of this. He was the top person at TBN when TBN was still relevant. I don't think it's as relevant anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and say that uh, he was that person. And I just believe that this was the first episode of cancellation uh, without revelation. You know, I don't believe that there was a revelation. And I was inspired by Bishop Pearson. And so I just wanted to do this today for my podcast and for this video. As I just, I, I really want to know your thoughts. I want to know your thoughts. I want you to uh, make those comments, make those comments wherever you can, whether you're looking at listening to this podcast or you are on YouTube looking at this video. I want you to go down below and let me know how Bishop Pearson impacted your life, how he impacted your life and what you think about all of this. What do you think about all of this? Because we know, we do know that his life was so interesting that there ended up being a movie, a movie about it. Let, let's be honest. There ended up being a movie about it. And then after going through all of that with the Joint College, uh, the Joint College of uh, African-American Pentecostal Bishops. And that's why I'm saying the black church, the black church, because what they did was they're basically saying, you got to believe like us or we're going to put you out. Now, let's be truthfully honest here 
going to give you the real deal holy feel here. What happens many times in many Pentecostal movements, uh, let's say the Church of God in Christ, because we've all seen episodes of this. We've all seen episodes of this, or even in the well, Baptists are not as much like this, but let's let's be real. When somebody gets in trouble, if a pastor does something and gets in trouble, what he does is he disassociates himself so that he can keep his ministry or separates out of that church if the church own if you know if the church owns the building or different things like that. I know plenty of episodes of that. I remember an episode of of a pastor who was giving paddlings, you know, to people I guess weren't paying tithes. He was giving spankings in the in the church in his office and going on. And he was big in Church of God in Christ. But, you know, he when he got in trouble and it all came to the light because it was all in the paper. Well, you know, gossip blogs and stuff like that. But it was still bad enough. Uh, he, he just left Church of God in Christ. He started his church. What was they going to take from him? They couldn't take anything from him. And so he just he just came out of fellowship and still pastored, you know, on his own. And so I'm just saying that's typically what happens now. You can counsel them from your organization, but many pastors now don't uh, go into that accountability of uh, of organizations such as Church of God in Christ or Baptist or PAW. They don't go into those organizations because of the accountability. They don't want to be accountable to nothing. That's why you have so many renegade bishops and renegade apostles, because they answer to no one. It's not accountability. Now, I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, many of them will start their own fellowships many times, and that's just that's just a level of dysfunction to me because that's just saying that uh, we're, we're just all coming together. We all got a beef with this organization. So we're going to come together to be better than that organization. And if you start something like that, stop, sit down somewhere, sit down somewhere and quit all that. Uh, you know, uh, just getting together with people and all y'all want to do is bash what's known out there. But I do believe that God speaks to people. And I believe that when he speaks to people, he gives them a revelation for a current situation and they are to walk into that. Now, this man, Bishop Pearson, lost everything, lost everything, including his lovely wife, Gina Pearson. We can never forget her. Lost her eventually, too. And uh, but he he knew God gave him that. He knew God gave him that. Many of them pastors who said what they said, who jumped on the bandwagon, all of that right there, a lot of them are not even relevant anymore. We, They are forgotten. They died and they gone. Nobody remembers them. True. Fact. The church done even moved on. Nobody remembers what you was doing there. And the thing that I want to make sure that we all look at is that when, you, when God gives you something, God many times will challenge you when he gives you the revelation for the situation is going to be challenging to you. Now, I, I, I love that he went with what he believed. He heard God uh, speak to him and what he gained from what God spoke to him became the gospel of inclusion. Whether you agree with it or not, that's what he says God gave him. That's what God gave him. Now, I do believe because he was so different I believe that many times people will hear something different. And when there's already a level of jealousy for you because you're able to excel at some things that they've never seen before, they don't want you becoming the voice of something they want to be in. And so I think that a lot of times that's more of the thing that happened. He was attacked because of his anointing, because of his charisma, because of his leadership. Because of his trend-setting ability, I don't think it really had anything to do with gospel of inclusion. That was just something that they were able to use um, as a as an amplifier for how they really felt about him. And so, um, I just want to say that I believe the black church owes him an apology. I'm gonna keep saying that we owe him an apology. So uh, now, if now I'm gonna say this: if if Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant can get on uh, and say on YouTube and everywhere else that the black church owes the homosexual community an apology. I believe that the church, now he said that, you know, a lot of people say, you don't speak for me. Well, everybody spoke in unison when it came to Bishop Pearson. And, and here's the problem. I believe the church itself has been and is still currently guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Hmm. I said it. I said what I said. I said what I said. I believe the church was then and is still currently now guilty of involuntary manslaughter. What do you what do you mean? 
I don't think they knew. I think when you look back retrospectively, you can think about, yeah, we should have did it different. Yeah, we didn't mean to take it that far. Yeah, no, we should have did. I don't think the intention was to just go all the way for everybody because there were members involved. And many times their pastors jumped on there without knowing the details of what was really going on. So you have pastors who their bishops felt a certain way. So they just echoed that sentiment without totally understanding what was going on. And they taught that to their people without an understanding. And many times that goes on in the world. Let's be very honest. The church is very fickle and it's it's hypocritical. It, it is. Come on, Kanye West. Kanye West was already rich, had billions and stuff like that. Then he decided to get Jesus in his life. And his main critic was the church. He got to go prove to everybody that he's saved. He got to show everybody that he's saved. And that's the problem I have with the church. If somebody wants to receive Jesus and say they saved, I'm okay. You ain't got to prove nothing to me. You got to prove it to Jesus. That's the only one that matters. And I thank God for the life legacy of Bishop Carlton Pearson. I thank God for him. And I thank God that preachers were able to hear him. Pastors were able to see him because not only did he teach us uh, you know, how to do conferences. He taught us a whole thing, how to articulate. Uh, you know, if you ever saw him preach, he was a great um, speaker. Uh, the way he talked eloquently, he was not only a great speaker, but, you know, he hooped. You know, I'm old school. I like the little hooping. But if you don't hoop, that's all good because he spoke well, uh, gave words that was full of revelation, full of revelation. But I just don't believe that every pastor, every leader is on the level that he was on. He was a scholar. And a lot of y'all talking need to sit down and shut up somewhere. Facts be known. This Rock Leach, I know I upset you and I hope I did. But I want you all to know that I thank God for radical people uh, like this great man, Bishop Carlton Pearson. Rest well, sir. And God bless you for the life that you live. 